All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. Well, good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from today. My name is Audrey Mossberger, and I'm the Senior Director of Events and Development at the National Bureau of Asian Research. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to today's virtual launch event, marking the release of the report, China's Digital Ambitions, a Global Strategy to Supplant the Liberal Order. Following each of today's panels, we'll open things up to an audience Q&A. For those joining us here on WebEx and via live stream, please email your questions to events at nbr.org. We encourage you to send these in prior to Q&A as you might find that your question is answered during the discussion. If not, our moderators will do their very best to present all questions to our panelists within the allotted time. Finally, for those interested in downloading a copy of the report, you can do so easily by clicking on the link that we will put in the chat box. Well, we have a very exciting lineup of speakers who are ready to go. And so with that, I will now turn it over to Mr. Francois Godemont. Thank you. Thank you very much, Audrey, and welcome to all. Uh, I'm going to be quick on the first point of the agenda, which is thanking, of course, NBR for uh, choosing us for this uh, presentation as an organization and thanking ECFR for uh, joining with its uh, European outreach. Uh, that's very uh, important. Uh, right after that, I'm going to say a few words. We literally address non-Americans who are going to read this report, whom I hope will read it, who must read it. The title is, you know, in the advocacy tradition, and you might think that you're going to have another uh, quite simple denunciation of how China uh, proceeds globally. Once you get in, you can't leave the report from page to page. It goes into arcane and hugely important issues. Uh, it synthesizes a number uh, of, of issues from infrastructure to platforms, to standards, to security risks, uh, to specific security risks, to recommendations. Second, it's not built on naivete, shall we say, uh, regarding our own little problems between Europeans and Americans. For example, in the very first few page, you will see a short description of Amazon that in a way acknowledges uh, that there is some kind of potential anti-competitive practice in, the, in a giant like uh, Amazon, which however I hasten to add is a midget uh, when you compare it to Alibaba uh, and Tencent. Uh, uh, China does 40% of e-commerce just by itself. Uh, you will notice that others' concerns are addressed. Uh, you will notice that the first recommendation in the end, and it's more path-breaking than it seems uh, when it's done in circles that deal with security uh, uh, and so on, is for the US to adopt GDPR-type regulations on data privacy, construct something rational, and it's a call uh, for different parties, uh, you know, to, to, to follow their next best, uh, to follow, to accept next best solutions in terms of compromise, because one of the key recommendations of the report is that no one country, no one actor can now face China alone. This is hugely important as well, because it makes it something of a balanced uh, report, which not only will teach you a lot on, on some of the issues uh, uh, involved, but will also make you wiser about what we could do collectively. I say that uh, Institut Montaigne and, 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 and its staff have some legitimacy in addressing these issues. Two of us uh, wrote a, 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 a research notes on 5G and Huawei. I wrote a report on digital privacy, a comparative report that has a lot about China. One of our colleagues wrote a report, a major report on fintech in China. Uh, recently, we published something on, on the, uh, on the uh, growing use of digital currency on the central banks of China plans for, uh, uh, for, for, for a digital currency. We have never been able to put together a synthesis uh, like these chapters and their conclusion has. So you may have your suspicions that, well, this is a bit of an advocacy thing. Yes, the US uh, has uh, some non-competitive practice, the big firms, everything that's fashionable in Europe to say, and there is always an element of truth in, the, in these issues. But the report goes much further uh, than this 
and, and therefore is must read uh, for any citizen, in fact, who is interested in these issues. Uh, I think I've used my time. Uh, I'm supposed to make just a small intro. I really encourage uh, our audience to follow each of the presentation very carefully and to download report and explore it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll be very brief. I'm Tara Verma from ECFR. I am also very happy that we're doing this uh, trilateral cooperation between NBR, Institut Montaigne and ECFR. Um, my colleague Yanka, who's on the first panel, is also has been following, I have to say, uh, China's digital strategy very closely. I encourage you to read our, our papers too, but I was very, very impressed by um, by the report. And I, I was thinking when Francois was speaking as well, that when we planned um, this trilateral cooperation, we were living in a very different world than the one we're living in today. And uh, everything that China is implementing very methodically and systematically in a way is is being done so as well at the Russian level in, in a much more accelerated manner. And so I think it is absolutely important for Europeans and uh, Americans to follow these trends because we're living through them right now. We need to be able to answer. And and um, the sub the subtitle of, of the report is a global strategy uh, to supplant the liberal order. And I think there is indeed a very clear objective from, from the Chinese side, and we need to be able to reply to that and to understand why we want to defend this liberal order, how we can do so. Um, we know that the European Union is a norm setter and it is a normative power. It is also little by little transforming itself into, into a hard power, and I hope we'll be able to, to discuss this later on in the discussion. Um, I will leave, yield my time now and thank again um, Institut Montaigne and NBR for co-organizing this with us. I'm looking forward to, the, to both discussions, I have to say, in the two panels. Thanks so much, Tara. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Ali Solinsky, and I'm the Vice President for Research at the National Bureau of Asian Research. Um, it's my pleasure uh, now to give a quick introduction, go a little bit more into detail uh, about the report that Francois already gave some truly wonderful accolades about. But uh, before I do, first, um, a very brief introduction of NBR, as many of our European audience may not be familiar with our organization. NBR is an American uh, nonpartisan policy research institution. We're based in Washington, D.C. and Seattle, Washington, so on both coasts of the United States. Um, we work exclusively on Asia. And our model is in each of the studies or projects we undertake to reach out and really work with a network of experts, the, the best experts, the top, uh, the top folks on that given topic. And so in this project, it's our pleasure to have worked with a really fantastic set of experts that um, have authored the chapters uh, that you'll hear from here today. And that includes our principal investigator, Emily de la Bruyere, and uh, also a really fantastic team working behind the scenes at MBR, uh, including my colleagues, Doug Strube and uh, Jonathan Merrick. So I just wanna give thanks to them for all their hard work on this. And of course, I must thank Institut Montaigne and ECFR for their partnership uh, in launching the report with you all here today. So this report, as I mentioned, is written by six different authors who bring their different areas of expertise to bear in understanding how China is advancing its digital strategy across different elements of the digital domain. The report covers key facets of China's digital strategy and details how China aims to replace the existing liberal and decentralized digital order with a state-centric one that forms the foundation of a new China-led geopolitical order. The report's six chapters work from both the bottom up and the top down to understand China's digital ambitions uh, before turning to an analysis of the implications of those findings and uh, how best to respond. So we'll hear from several of the chapter authors here today. Um, and I also wanted to point out, as was already mentioned, the report is accompanied by an interactive data tool, which is available at China's digital influence.mbr.org. And we can also put that link in, in the chat for you all uh, if you're interested in exploring it. 
that that tool features a number of visualizations that highlight the growing reach of China's digital activities and the ambitions that they represent. So with that, I really want to leave enough time for our presenters to dive into uh, the, the topics here today. Um, and before I turn it over to our first panel, uh, it's also our absolute pleasure to uh, welcome our keynote speaker uh, here today, Bart Gruthius. Bart Gruthius is a member of the European Parliament on behalf of the Dutch People's Party for Freedom and Democracy, which is part of the liberal political group Renew Europe. He is a member of the Industry, Research and Energy Committee and a substitute member for the Committees of Foreign Affairs and Security and Defense. Before Bart Gruthius became a member of the European Parliament in February of 2020, he was head for cybersecurity for the Dutch Ministry of Defense. And so with that, we're very pleased to have uh, Mr. Bart Gruthius speak to us uh, for our panel discussion here today. Thanks a lot, Alison, and all previous speakers. Thanks for inviting me, and it's an honor to be here on your panel. Um, like you said, I was uh, head of cybersecurity at the Dutch Ministry of Defense, and I've done it with great pleasure. Um, but being a politician is also uh, even sometimes even more satisfactory even more satisfactory than being there. It's so good to um, to take all that, that those lessons from that practical knowledge you have all the way up to uh, Brussels to get that into practice. I've always seen cyber as a great enabler, a great enabler for the Chinese digital strategy. Um, it was very reinvigorating to see how the Chinese operated in the digital domain, not that what they said they were doing, but actually what they were doing, what are the things they are looking at. And I think that cyber is a great enabler. It has an outsized role, an outsized role in the Chinese digital strategy. It touches on competitiveness, competition, commercial competition. It touches on technological advancement, but it even touches on elements of warfare. So it touches on nearly everything, is an enabler. Um, China is already on the stage as a cyber competitor, but it's growing. And I think we have, we have to counter what is there, but we also have to go counter two trends. I see China as a cyber actor on steroids, on doping, and I will tell you why. There's two main trends I'd like to point out here in this small introductory remarks I'd like to make as an addition also uh, um, to, to the rep great report that you put forward and the discussions you'll be having in depth on a great strategy. Um, but let me first start by my first trend. I'm very worried about why I think that China is on steroids. The first thing is that the great, the greatest zero day factory in the world nowadays does not stand in Israel. What many people think it doesn't, it, it's, it's nowhere near in the U S I think it's in China. And it has to do, if you don't know what, what zero days are, zero days are unknown vulnerabilities. There are known vulnerabilities in hardened software, but they are unknown to the cybersecurity community. Antivirus vendors do not know what they are, so they can't protect them. So with zero days, you can hack into machines, you can access servers, you can access memory, you can access data, whatever you want. So there's a factory being created by law in China because Chinese researchers on zero days on these vulnerabilities are not even allowed to share that data outside China. They are not allowed to compete anymore with American competitions like Pwn to Own. You can earn one, two, three, five hundred thousand dollars if you disclose software vulnerabilities there, give them to vendors so that they have time to patch it and make the internet safer. I am personally rapporteur on the Europe's new cybersecurity legislation, NIS2, and I make sure there's a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process there to make sure that the internet gets safe. What the Chinese have said, we don't want that. We want to keep that inside our country and we want to have a process that we have it first as government. So they can use any zero day being up, produced by the Chinese research community. So that's why I say it's on steroids. And the reason why I say it is because if you combine this capability of the Chinese state uh, with the capabilities they already have, a gigantic, massive volume of computer network operators operating against our interest here in the West, stealing intellectual property, making sure, but also political espionage and, um, and this information, et cetera. It's a, it's a huge new capability, which I'm afraid of that will be used in the next couple of years to come. 
and it's uh, an offensive superiority we haven't seen yet in the West. The second reason I think they are on steroids and there is a, a doping effort here is because, um, like we all know, uh, everyone here connected knows about the uh, Chinese supply chain and how that is being exported throughout the world. There's no doubt. Um, but the discussions we have in Europe, for example, and which I really commend the people to read the report of the MBR because of it, um, the discussions are not deep enough on why this matters. And let me just illustrate it by what Professor Godmond just said on 5G and Huawei. Let me just take that as an example. Because journalists ask me as a politician, what do you think? Does Huawei have backdoors or not? And I say, that's not the question. That's not the right question to ask. Because any software update could insert a new backdoor. It's also very much more concerned of is being locked in. It's that you become dependent on a certain vendor a certain vendor from an autocratic country like China for installation, for maintenance, for innovation, and for new technological and business opportunities. That's what I'm afraid of. Uh, people would come inside your telecommunications operating uh, situation rooms, etc., and in server rooms. That's problematic. In 2017, of course, the, le the legislation in China was clear. You have to cooperate with any request from the Chinese state and intelligence services. The cooperation with the CCP is clear. It's also what the NBR report states. There's also a clear link with the PLA, with personnel going back and forth, and whether some of these companies know that people might be doing something for the CCP and for the state, or a CEO of Huawei does not know, doesn't even matter. It has huge human intelligence risks here as well. And apart from that, I always tell journalists, it's also a political, strategic, and except especially the military, political, strategic, military environment we are working, operating in. The 5G is the political nerve system of our future societies. So I always say you either control that telecommunications backbone or you become someone else's signals intelligence colony. And it's very important that people will start realizing that this is what is at stake. And the Chinese, with expanding in a very cheap way, uh, very advanced, also with good equipment, I have to admit, um, is, is a problem in all these manners I just mentioned. And I think that if you look at the threats there, the European Commission has not just addressed significantly the such threats. The European Court of Auditors has recently said that 5G policies that have been put forward by the Commission are not adopted um, harmonized throughout Europe. It's not being taken seriously enough. Pressure from the US has not helped. So I will come back to that later when I say what has to be done about it and how to counter it. Um, I will touch very shortly about what they're doing with telecommunications and routing attacks and their future capability, possible capability with quantum computing of decrypting traffic. Um, all in all, we see a, a, a competitor on the world stage we haven't seen before. When I got into office at the Dutch Ministry of Defense, we saw Chinese operators uh, sending spear phishing emails and that's it. But nowadays, the most advanced operators don't use spear phishing. It's much, much more stealthy. It's much better. It's much more advanced than we've ever, ever seen. So I think they were on steroids. And I think that what we're looking at is that geography no longer really counts in when it comes to geopolitics, but technology does. So that's why the digital strategy, what you wrote about is so important. Now, how to counter this, this opioid cyber acting? I think there's a couple of things that we can do. We've discussed at length, of course, um, what we could do on China to convince themselves not to do it, right? But it's in their own jurisdiction. I think that we should be not too subtle. We, 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 we're, not, we're not able to, to, to convince them to deter them. There's no deterrence in cyberspace. We have no empirical evidence that deterrent by punishment will help. There might be some deterrence by, by, by denial, but we'll, that's what we can talk about now. I think that we have to do it from our own jurisdiction. We have to make sure that this enabler for the digital strategy we'll be discussing later will be counted. And the first is, of course, building our own resilience in a way that we are not susceptible to Chinese pressure. And that means cybersecurity, the legislation I'm responsible for in the European Parliament. Um, it means also the Cyber Resilience Act on better soft and hardware. It also means on no longer admitting toys which are unsafe 
for, uh, Wi-Fi toys, smart toys from Alibaba and our markets. If they're not safe, we can't do it. We, we, we can protect ourselves and we must. The second thing is in the supply chain. Europe has not addressed the supply chain significantly. When I speak to government ministers around Europe and about colleagues here in Parliament, all agree. All say there's no clarity. We don't know what risky vendors are. There's no legal basis. And we are afraid that our country will be hit if we out them. So Brussels needs to step up and make new legislation, whether that is the Cyber Resilience Act that Ursula von der Leyen announced, whether it is, it's an addition to the Cyber Security Act that is already there or a new act. I will be calling for it. I did so last week in Strasbourg with some commissions. The third thing we need to do is also address the Chinese in a diplomatic way collective countermeasures when we see it happening. The low cost, low risk, low high reward calculus in Beijing must be reversed. And we've seen the European Union acting as a geopolitical actor against Russia. And parts of that posture must be projected towards China in order to deter some of their um, malign behavior on the world stage. Communicating that norm is essential, I think. Now, um, what I what my intention is is here in Europe is um, to release the pressure points that China has inside so we can't be susceptible for blackmail or any form of pressure. That is the main reason. And I want to do it from my own jurisdiction. So if we're talking about countering that's that, that, that the digital strategy you'll be talking discussing later, if I look at what I can do, I want to do it from my own jurisdiction. I want to make legislation that is, um, is, is clear for the Chinese, that might mirror some of the stuff that, that China has against European companies, etc. But I want to do it from our own jurisdiction. Being able, like we did in the past, saying this is not good, that is not good, and being on a world stage preaching is not going to help. It is from your own jurisdiction where we have that power. And that is where the European Union can find its power. And we found it in the last weeks against Russia, and I really hope we can use it against uh, some of the things that China is doing. And some other things, of course, are, are great to cooperate with China as well. Um, what is starting as cyber is a great enabler is also, um, I must say, a problem in itself. I hope we can counter much more than we did in the past. I'm really looking forward to uh, making a transatlantic cooperation and with other parts of Asia, with a democratic liberal alliance to make sure that we keep our liberal world order, rule-based order as much as alive. We can find alternatives to authoritarian regime uh, thinking and make sure that we are a, an attractive partner. Uh, more relevant than we were, making sure that we show more of the digital uh, stuff back to Europe and making sure that we can provide more security also below the threshold of Article 5 to many of our allies around the world. And I would like to thank you for inviting me and make sure that we have a safer space around Western Europe and the, uh, the, the transatlantic ties that we have is global. for me very important. Thank you very much and I'm looking forward to the rest of the debate. Did I start the first round table? I guess so. Uh, yes, please go ahead, Francois. Okay, just wanted to make sure there was no, uh, nobody in between. Uh, thank you very much, Bart, by the way, for this uh, uh, thought feeling uh, uh, speech. Uh, and uh, I'm not going to comment on the security aspects because the second round table in an hour will be precisely focused around those issues. Uh, our roundtable is uh, really a scene setter about China's global strategy, and I'm going to uh, introduce the uh, speakers in a minute. I, I just like to say as a, as a, as a start uh, for this, uh, that the report uh, emphasizes uh, two things. One is the absolute impossibility to distinguish state from other actors, uh, whether they are uh, companies which are hybrid or so-called so private, and sometimes are technically private, but politically subjected, or even NGOs and organizations, uh, that's very clear. And therefore, there is the, the, the chief asymmetry, apart from the amount of money uh, that Mr. Xi Jinping has decided to spend on digital innovation, is clearly on this top-down top coordination which is gigantic and it's completely asymmetric, or mostly asymmetric, 
to uh, what we do. And the example of Western divisions, for example, on many aspects of digital policy sort of proves it. Uh, this is uh, hugely important. Uh, the second uh, aspect, the second uh, general remark is that we go way beyond the usual descriptions uh, of uh, narrow uh, reaches or uh, competitive or, or anti-competitive or economic bias in the uh, in China's uh, economic uh, system. What we see is really a top-down look-through. I borrow the word from uh, finance uh, aim of the Chinese government. First of all, domestically, and then in, and then applied internationally. The report is frank, by the way. I just want to say that in areas where China is not yet completing its agenda. For example, I think I, I, I will leave the floor to, to the speakers very, very, very shortly, but uh, it, it, it makes clear that, that China is not yet the main standard setter uh, in the digital area, but it makes it clear that it's the one that makes the most efforts. And given the dynamic trend, uh, one might expect indeed that it would become, it could become uh, if we don't move the chief standard setter. There are many other examples, but I'm not here to discuss them. I just want to encourage you again to read the report. And I will introduce the three speakers very quickly uh, in the order uh, where they will uh, speak. First, uh, Emily de la Brière uh, is a non-resident fellow at the NBR, and she's also a co-founder of Horizon Advisory, a consulting firm uh, that is specifically focused on, on the interplay between economics and politics uh, in Chinese uh, policies. Uh, she's got an extensive research experience in, 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 in uh, including in language. Uh, and she is the author, of course, of the chapter of the study that relates to standards. We'll be very happy to listen to her. Uh, my friend, Yanka Ortel, uh, is the director of the Asia program at the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, a clearly influential uh, position, uh, and uh, she's had past jobs, which I won't even uh, attempt to list, uh, but it's uh, very clear that she's an expert on both EU-China relations and also both China-US and EU-US. She has a kind of wider view that also comes from her past experience, and that's very important. She's going to be uh, our uh, lead commenter commentator for, apart from the two co-authors uh, in this session. Dr. Samantha Hoffman is a senior analyst at the Australian, uh, the, sorry, Australian Strategic Policy Institute uh, and at, the, at its International Cyber Policy uh, Center. And she's more focused on state security and on the uh, uh, potential uh, for China's welding together data collection, artificial intelligence, uh, rules on data storage, and a number of uh, issues. And her chapter, uh, which is on the infrastructures uh, that China is building in and out of China, uh, specifically outlines uh, the potential for data collection and data use that is created uh, by these uh, infrastructures. She's also very fair, by the way, in acknowledging that China is not yet the main actor, uh, but rising so fast and with so different rules uh, that we cannot afford uh, to uh, take it as a threat in the future. It's something that's coming to us now. And as Tara uh, said, I guess the Russian situation and the Russia-China uh, conjunctions makes it even more clear today. Uh, Emily, you will speak first, uh, and uh, you have, I think, a quarter of an hour, if I'm correct, uh, and uh, I, I give you the floor. Thank you, Francois, and thank you to the Institute Montaigne and ECFR for putting this on. I will try not to take the whole quarter of the hour in order to leave room for conversation um, after I speak, and when I start being redundant, please cut me off. But I wanted to begin with the overall framing for this report and the overall argument for what it is that animates China's digital strategy that we argue and that we lay out. And that's that Beijing sees 
the present as a particularly important window of opportunity. As Beijing sees it, there's a new industrial revolution underway. This industrial revolution is catalyzed by data having emerged as a factor of production. As with all past industrial revolutions, the implications of this will be a reshuffling of the global order and a rewriting of its systems. And in Beijing's diagnosis, if it can control data, it can not only rise within, but in fact, reshape the international paradigm and it can control the world. Um, information and information flows are poised to shape the production, the distribution, and the consumption of goods, of ideas, um, of people moving forward. And so China's effort is to shape information and information flows so that it can shape, um, in turn, the people, the goods, the ideas. At a first level, this includes information access. China is clearly trying to lock in for itself superior information on the global environment. Beijing does this through its domestic policy that ensures access to its company's information, but it also does this through building out a much larger international network of um, physical and virtual infrastructures. But the next beat of China's strategy is that it's actually working not only just to access that information, but to shape it so that it can decide which information moves where um, at what pace, through what systems. If China can do this, again, it can control the global system. From an informational perspective, Beijing would not only have a platform for its disinformation and propaganda, but it would also be able to target that to recipients, um, targeting their proclivities and also what captures attention. And this would be matched by China's um, highly unprivate ability to claim information on individuals. Um, in a military perspective, if China's ambitions reach their logical conclusion, the People's Liberation Army would have superior information on the battle space. It would also be able to distort um, or the adversary's information or prevent the adversary from acquiring any. And then there's the commercial level. Again, if taken to their logical conclusions, China would be able to lock in a non-market advantage for its companies. Um, because it would be able to feed them superior information on the economic system. It could also potentially prevent um, other competitive companies from accessing necessary information, could distort the information they received, um, and would be able to shape the operating environment for consumers in a way that might lead them to privilege Chinese companies. And the same story holds for value chains and the potential ability of China to shape those values, lock in its control over them and cut them off if useful. As we lay out in this report, the effort takes, multi takes multiple forms. There's this, um, to again borrow terms that have already been used today, bottom up approach to build international digital infrastructure. Physical things like space satellites, like data centers, like telecommunications networks, but also virtual platforms whether those are social media or payment systems um, or softwares for port logistics. These lock in dependence, as was mentioned, they lock in Chinese access to information and they also shape the user's in, um, interaction with the digital environment. At the same time, from the top down, Beijing is working to set international technical standards and to shape international digital governance in such a way that it would lock in these advantages for China. Um, and lock in a system that perpetuates its norms and its competitive advantages. Throughout every one of these steps, um, China benefits from its size. It can offer the biggest networks, the biggest platforms, and that makes them uniquely competitive. China also benefits from its centralization, its ability to ensure that its quote unquote private sector actors are fulfilling the strategic agenda of the state, whether that is voting in standard setting organizations according to Chinese preferences, or building out the infrastructures, the digital infrastructures that Beijing wants them to build out, or of course, sharing information with the Chinese government. China also benefits from its industrial capacity. This grants it leverage over the international private sector. It lets it control and, um, key value chains and ensure global dependence on them. And quite simply, it allows it to build out the infrastructure on which China's digital ambition rests. Part and parcel of all of these is a one-sided integration into the global system. The fact that China is able to collect and shape information internationally without allowing the same kind of access and influence from foreign players. The overall picture 
is a frightening one. Um, and it's not one, a point that we want to stress, um, that seems like it can be addressed by any one country. It demands coordination. It demands coordination, multilateral coordination at every stage of China's strategy, at the question of physical products and their production, at the question of building out infrastructures, scaling platforms, but also at defining the rules of the digital system, technical standards, and also digital governance. Throughout all of that, there has to be a unified vision. There has to be a unified vision among the US, the EU, and other like-minded countries, not only on the threat that China poses, and not only the necessary mechanisms for response, but also what the positive alternative is. What does a digital architecture supported by like-minded countries and supporting a positive future actually look like? And that's, I think, a question that has to be answered so that the, the right defensive and also proactive measures to compete with China's approach can be taken. And on that note, I'll cede any remaining time I might have. Thank you very much, Emily. And thank you for knowing better than me the uh, timing for each speaker. I was going to undemocratically cut down the time allotted for questions. So I move immediately to uh, Yanka, who I think is uh, prepared for a, 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 a much shorter than 15 minutes uh, uh, intervention. On to you, Yanka. Thank you so much, Francois, and thank you to all of you for the organization and for, for having me and for allowing me to comment. Um, I could not agree more with the analysis of the report, and I will not try to, um, to add to the incredible substance that Emily and Samantha can bring to this. But actually, I would like to do uh, one thing, because the last two weeks have left me full of questions and not answers. Um, I think that a lot of basic parameters have been called into question, and this is what I would like to do at this stage. I would just like to pose a couple of additional questions here. I think you know, we, we can all agree that striving for national tech sovereignty and independence from foreign tech components, building national champions despite ambiguous relations to some of the privately owned enterprises, a drive to capture regional and global market shares from 5G to cloud technology, making the world dependent on Chinese tech um, and use that to gain economic strength and influence and if necessary um, to achieve political goals. All of that um, is something that we could all observe at the moment. It happens in plain sight and what has Emily nicely put as one sided integration. The underlying assumption, though, that we apply is that national strength emerges to a large degree from innovation capacity and from economic strength, growth at home and abroad. And global technology is used to create a China-friendly global digital environment and gave overall dominance in advanced technology to improve the strategic position, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the United States. So it's not per se about the digital um, technology, but it is about the overall strategic position. So if we deduce from that, that China's digital strategy is part of China's economic power, econom and economic power is the basis for national strength. And I have to say a couple of the things that we've seen over the last two weeks leave me very puzzled. Do we have it right in what we seem to see as China's priorities? What we have been vit witnessing is not only um, you know, over the last few years, a radical approach to tech companies at home when the emergence of alternative power structures is challenging state dominance, but even more so to have a willingness to really pay at least a short term economic price for political goals. And in that constant, and in that context, I would say the China-Russia partnership on tech is particularly interesting to look at. It is not so significant in terms of scale, but it's highly significant in terms of strategy because it helps with the approach to the global system. Do we now, after what has happened over the past two weeks, over the kind of decisions that have been taking um, on siding with Moscow on Ukraine, do we have to set reset some of the parameters that we apply here? So coming to a couple of the questions that are in my head that I haven't kind of figured out the answers yet, but maybe we can do that all together, is how much economic cost is China willing to pay for its position on Russia right now? And what would be the impact on China's global digital strategy? Um, is our assumption correct that there would be a limit to the willingness of an economic cost that is it's willing to pay, um, or has it to be much more than we expect? What does that mean? Is China willing to swallow technology setbacks due to sanctions? If so, how many? 
Um, where is the end to that? And I think that's a really important question. We particularly look at the areas in the report that detail where China is not ahead yet, and where China still has some catching up to do, and where there are still kind of where still lacks in its own supply chain, for example. Will there? What is the assessment in Beijing on, on how much cost can be borne? Um, what still presents yeah this 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 kind of weakness of of dependencies? Will there be a quiet rollback? Um, to safeguard technology supply? Will there be a quiet acquiescence to kind of structural dependencies that are there? Um, and is this actually in our interest? Or should something else be in our interest? Should it actually be in our interest to move even stronger on the sanctions front? Or will there actually even be a counteroffensive from the Chinese side to safeguard this kind of approach that it has um, to kind of, uh, the, the, the global system in that regard, um, and to use this opportunity of distraction of the international community um, to push back um, and to use its position of strength in that regard um, against what is happening at the moment in terms of a realignment of the West around these questions. I do think that the comments by Jali Jen that we've had yesterday in terms of you know, its willingness to push back against sanctions is something that we should take note of at least. So my question is, what do we have to be prepared for that could come out of this? What cost is China willing to inflict on us at a moment when we are at a very kind of crucial juncture? And what costs are we ready to bear um, when it comes to kind of countering and, and keeping all of our similar goals at the same time? So I, I think it is, it is many of these questions where I say, in light of the things that have happened over the last two weeks, where maybe as the um, authors of the report, where would you make readjustments? Where would you double down? Um, what are the areas that you think, what are the arguments that are maybe more troubling um, in light of what has happened? Um, and what is a bit, um, where, where do you say you definitely have it right and you're in the zone? And I would leave it at that and would be very curious what Samantha has to say. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Yanka. And I guess you hit it on the nail. Uh... Europe has been caught between complaining about U.S. extraterritorial sanctions and realizing that if Europe is a geopolitical project uh, in a globalized world, it needs to have its own secondary sanctions with some extraterritorial reach. Uh, what's happening between China and Russia on the fintech uh, and other fronts, aerospace also potentially, uh, is really a test case. Uh, and also the, to start with the use of the euro. I won't go any further. Uh, I uh, now switch to uh, uh, Samantha Hoff Dr. Samantha Hoffman uh, for uh, the third presentation, reminding uh, you that she has worked on the infrastructures of uh, China's uh, digital network, but the word infrastructure stretches pretty far, I guess. Uh, Dr. Hoffman, on to you. And thank you. I don't know if you're participating from uh, Australia, but uh, in this case, it's an ungodly hour. and. Uh, uh, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. You know, I, I greatly appreciate that this is the first time since uh, the pandemic began that I'm physically uh, in, in Europe and, and it's wonderful not oh. to be speaking at one o'clock in the morning right now, although I am still slightly jet lagged um, and hopefully that doesn't show in my comments. Thank you so much for, for giving me the opportunity to, to contribute to, to this volume and, and to speak today. Um, so my chapter focused on the expansion of Chinese dig digital infrastructure internationally. And um, the, the key finding really is that although this topic is now widely discussed, um, I think it still remains uh, vastly misunderstood and, and oversimplified in many ways. Um, before I go into the, the main argument, though, um, I think it's useful just to go over the, the definition of, of uh, what kind of infrastructure we're talking, uh, talking about in this particular chapter. Um, so, so for China, um, uh, seeing the value in the um, technologies and, and the digital infrastructure um, technologies and the data they help generate, the party state prioritizes um, investing and building in uh, what it calls new infrastructure, uh, such as artificial intelligence, 5G, and data centers. Um, it refers generally to the infrastructure that enables the Internet of Things, the industrial Internet of Things, and other data-dependent environments like smart cities and smart manufacturing. Um, this infrastructure, I think, is better, it's better described as uh, digital infrastructure, and it refers to both the hardware, um, physical hardware and software that enables digital connectivity. Um, <clears throat> 
at the physical layer that would include things such as smart cameras, smart cars, smart appliances, and other IoT sensors and devices uh, that help to support, um, ideally, uh, real-time decision-making. Um, technology that enables data storage or data flows, uh, such as 5G, um, uh, and help to deliver and exchange that information. Uh, and uh, as well as artificial intelligence and big data processing that help to derive value out of that data. Uh, so, for instance, uh, fiber optic cables, data centers, and IoT devices all enable connectivity in smart cities. So that's sort of the scope of, of what we're talking about um, in, in this particular uh, chapter. Um, now, when, when I say that I think that the issue of digital infrastructure expansion internationally is vastly misunderstood, the, the reason for that um, sort of comes through the conversation about what we're talking about with China's tech authoritarianism or what I prefer to refer to as China's tech enhanced authoritarianism. Uh, when we talk about that domestically, oftentimes the conversation is focused on the most coercive uses of technology. Um, and it's seen as something that's um, somewhat separate from the technology that helps to solve problems. Whereas the way that I look at it through a lens of um, state security or China's social management strategy, you see that actually um, uh, the technologies that we should be concerned about and that enhance authoritarianism are both problem solving um, and uh, related to the party's expansion and protection of its own power. So they can be um, uh, solving the problems that any, any government would seek to solve, as well as uh, helping the party state to en enhance its authoritarian control. Those two things aren't actually fundamentally contradictory. And those same technologies are the ones that I discussed in, the, in this chapter that are, that are expanding globally. Uh, domestically, uh, these technologies are designed to um, meet a very specific party state need. Uh, so we talk a little bit in this uh, volume about standards. Uh, Emily's chapter focuses more on that, uh, but, but my uh, chapter in particular highlights the fact that domestically companies, along with the domestic research institutes, participate in standard setting bodies that set the standard for technologies such as facial recognition systems or the database schema behind a smart cities uh, platform. And um, Technologies designed to, to meet those standards and to win domestic bids, uh, a, project, a new project would have to meet those new standards. And those technologies are what are being exported globally. Now, um, probably trying to cover too much in, in my six minutes spiel, but, um, but the next thing I sort of want to discuss is, is what, um, what we're talking about in terms of a problem and what China seeks to do with the data that, it, that, that these products help generate. So, when we think about the expansion of technology globally, the most most conversation is focused on the surveillance technologies and the inherently sort of invasive um, or coercive technologies. And what's overlooked is the fact that any technology that helps to generate data can be significant in terms of understanding a society um, and can be significant in terms of not necessarily the, the end user, but whoever has access downstream to, to that data set might derive value from it. So in some of my research, which, which I highlighted in this chapter, um, previous research, I described a, a case study um, and a 2019 report that I wrote about a company called Global Tone Communications Technology, which is a propaganda department controlled company that basically does machine translation services. Um, and their products were embedded according to the company's own claims uh, in the supply chain of AliCloud and, and Huawei. In particular, with Huawei, it would have been in, um, inclusive of a smart conferencing solution that Huawei provides in a smart cities package. The data, it, you know, a lot of the conversation on the data security, uh, or not the data security law, but the intelligence law focuses on uh, companies being asked to hand over data to uh, to the Chinese government. But in this case, you see a supply chain problem where the uh, the company that's helping to supply Huawei is actually controlled by the propaganda department. So any data that's collected to help provide that machine translation service is also going back to the company that's controlled by the propaganda department. You don't need the intervention for for that to be going towards a, a purpose that that might not be the stated intention of of that technology's sort of end use. So 
risk is, I guess, the, the big point without getting too too much into the weeds right now, happy to say more in the Q&A, is just that we need to think more broadly about the implications of, of the technology. Uh, uh, it's, it's not just the end user, it's not just the end use, it's also what the data can help uh, contribute to. Uh, in that TTCOM case, it would be the generation of more effective um, uh, uh, like automated uh, automated text, for instance, that could contribute to more effective propaganda. Um, if you're talking about, um, I think like a lot of the, the conversational propaganda focuses on the the outputs, say on Twitter, and it misses what uh, what's happening to help make those outputs more effective in a long term, not today, but maybe in five years. Um, so, I, I think I'll, I'll wrap it up and just say that what we need to be thinking about is um, how do we develop strategies for more effectively identifying risk? A lot of the places that are that are making decisions about the um, about the uh, use of Chinese digital infrastructure would be local governments, private companies. Uh, how do we give them the toolkit to try to understand uh, what they're dealing with? Um, and, and who, who are the companies? What are the some digital supply chain risks? How do we define that? Uh, those are all questions that we need to be thinking about rather than coming up with just prescriptive policy solutions. Um, we, we, can't, we can't do that right now when we haven't clearly identified the problem. And so I think that uh, more research like this, uh, training, um, you know, training uh, new researchers to try to understand these sort of digital supply chain risks will be incredibly important in in countering the problem that, that I'm seeing emerge and that we identify in this report. Thank you very much, uh, Samantha, uh, for this presentation. Uh, I'm going, of course, to turn to the audience, which is starting to uh, fill in with uh, questions. Uh, I have my own questions, of course, but before that, I think actually what Yonka has said was in part a question addressed to, to us all, but particularly to the two other speakers and how much the last two weeks and the, the display of uh, uh, semi-complicity or total complicity, depending on your views, uh, between China and Russia uh, sort of makes more urgent uh, what is being described in this report, what's concrete. My own answer uh, would say that the first, tech, the first test is really going to come uh, with fintech uh, with the possibility of, the, you know, the union pay uh, uh, system of uh, smaller Chinese banks and especially those that are placed in Moscow of e-commerce uh, from China, suddenly expanding and filling voids. And if, is China going to allow that uh, or is it going to be fearful uh, of losing uh, more in other areas? That's a big question mark about China's behavior beyond the empty speeches. Uh, the talk about mediation and neutrality and whatever, and there was no invasion uh, and so forth. Uh, but uh, I, I, I would be curious to hear uh, any uh, thoughts about that from our two other speakers, if possible. Maybe I'll give the floor first to, 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 uh, to Emily and then quickly to, to Samantha. Absolutely. I, I agree entirely about the payment space is a really interesting one to watch. Overall, I think the developments of the past two weeks amplify all the trends that we talk about, um, make the threat seem that much more severe and really, for the most part, underline the reality of it. Um, I also think, unfortunately, that China sees a lot of opportunity in the present moment. Um, there's a twofold question in terms of opportunities vis-a-vis -vis Russia directly. One is the possibility that um, a pullout of Western or um, let's call it like-minded systems from Russia gives space for Chinese players to enter that market and to incorporate um, Russia onto their systems. So um, that's direct trade. It's also payment systems. It's also operating systems. There's plenty of Chinese press about Microsoft's withdrawal and whether that means that Russia will move over to Linux, which is a Chinese preference. Um, that's, you know, largely at the margins, it gives a little, it gives more weight to China's overall agenda. It doesn't necessarily change anything. And already there is an alignment there. I think that there's a larger risk about Beijing's intentions to manipulate 
potential intentions to manipulate an, an era of resource shortages and economic hardship that's likely to result from this invasion in order to lock in even greater um, dependence on the part of the international system. If China can properly play the middle line here, um, it may be able to turn around to, for example, Europe in three months and say, hi, we're now your supplier of energy, critical resources, whatever it is that Beijing can offer um, in exchange for more alignment with China's campaign as Europe tries to deal with the fallout of the present crisis. Um, also, Russia's invasion, I think, has opened the door for more aggressive posturing on the part of authoritarian challengers in general. We're in a new era now, whether we like it or not, where I think authoritarian states can very explicitly say that they're out to challenge the international system and the norms we rest on. And Beijing will do so more subtly than Russia does, as it is inclined to do. But I think that still lends fuel to China's larger efforts to reshape the international system and to do so now explicitly and without couching that in quite as much um, opacity or um, attempts to hide it. That said, one optimistic note, and then I'll stop, is that I think there's also been a huge wake-up call to these risks as a result of the invasion and a recognition of the need to respond and Yank, as you said the need to respond even if it comes at a cost which is has been one of the major obstacles to responding to china's challenge is that it will be expensive and it will hurt companies it will hurt individuals but now i think that we've seen what can happen um there seems to be a much greater willingness to absorb those costs thank you i'll switch I, to, I to, to to samantha for the following but perhaps uh, even uh, trying to direct you samantha a little more precisely if at some point you can on the linkage between what china may be doing to uh, go around sanctions uh, with russia speculatively because we're not completely there we, we see hints and examples and the fallout for china's digital infrastructures in third countries and in europe in the us if you have some views maybe it's a little premature to ask you that but uh, we're all curious. Thank you. Well, I, I completely agree with, with everything that Emily just said. And um, I, I think the, the thing that I've been thinking about the most has been, um, so a lot of my previous research, I looked at, at China's um, threat perceptions and the way that um, you can tie those threat perceptions to uh, uh, the development of, of of technology or, or use of technology um, as as part of the party's state security process, and one thing that you notice if you go, I mean, you go back to Tiananmen, you go back to the color revolutions, the Jasmine Revolution, and you see China talking exactly about this kind of event and how this this sort of um, reinforces the need to uh, shield itself uh, fr from from the risk of. Um, so, so we're, I guess, sorry, particularly with digital payments, I think, you know, part of what, what's being overlooked with DCEP is, is the conversation's been focused on the internationalization of the RMB, whereas, in fact, um, as, as we pointed out in, in some of the research that I've done at, at ASPE, um, uh, there's research that uh, uh, Matt Johnson has done uh, and, and written with some of our publications there where he talks a, a lot about also the, the um, technology itself as as being the real risk because the technology is designed to change the um uh international norms and so even the way that you would define say what's corrupt or who's identified as a as a potential um uh sort of case of terrorist financing all those things are politically defined uh in within china and then the technology is sort of uh the sort of embedding those those definitions as part of the response and and so it's not just the um i guess what i'm trying to say it's the technology itself that that's game changing uh rather than the um implications for the internationalization of the rmb and so what you've already seen happening for many years now is china reacting and preparing for exactly this type of event um and and you're starting to see the the outcomes already uh I don't have too many things to say about the last two weeks, largely because I've been traveling. Uh, so I, I haven't uh, maybe been as up to date on on Chinese state media conversation as I need to be uh, right now to, to make an intelligent comment there. 
Thank you very much. I'll switch to questions from the uh, audience. The first one has a regional tilt. Uh, what should the EU and the US do, do to counter China's influence on digital infrastructure and digital governance legislation in the Middle East? How can the EU and US cooperate better in doing this? Let me say first that the report actually has a lot of mentions of uh, uh, India, a test case about Malaysia, China, uh, some mention of Indonesia, and another test case on uh, Korea, Japan, China, past cooperation on standards essentially to counter, uh, at least from Japan's point of view, I can still remember Taro Azo, the minister being at the head of it, the conservative, certainly in defense terms, very pro-American, or very, very defensive towards China, but in competitive terms, uh, opposed to Microsoft uh, and wishing for an alternative. So it's not the report acknowledges that a lot of the competition uh, is about third country. Uh, in my view, it's true the Middle East and Africa are the, the, the gaming grounds uh, for China's digital companies for infrastructure. Low cost, conveniency, less, no reservations against surveillance, or quite the contrary, uh, surveillance welcome. Uh, it's a key issue, but I'd be very curious to see if you have a, a more precise take uh, on this. Maybe maybe Yanka wants to, to, to react first, and then I will either Emily or Samantha, or I mean, whoever, just sign off to me. Sure, I fully agree with your points. Why I would also say it's the Middle East and Africa uh, that are the battlegrounds here and the battlegrounds that we can certainly identify now already. There's um, at the moment, um, and when we look at our bandwidth of things that we can deal with, probably relatively little that we can and will be willing to do to actually compete on these grounds. Um, and I say that with a high degree of caution, but knowing um, how difficult it already was under non-war conditions to talk about things like global gateway, international infrastructure building, financing from the EU side, you know, putting things together, putting things together on the table with Japan, uh, Japan with the US, um, that's not going to become easier. And I see that as a huge strategic advantage for China. Um, if it is able to kind of separate these things um, in, in, on its own agenda and able to move forward in these regions, then this could present itself as a huge advantage, as a huge strategic advantage right now um, to, act, to, um, to just kind of enhance um, its strategic reach. And these are long-term decisions that are then being taken. If Chinese um, companies are predominantly present in the infrastructure, in the digital infrastructure of these countries, then that's not going to change anytime soon afterwards. And so when these decisions are kind of locked in, and that will also make any kind of moves that we're doing right now in the future much more complicated. And that's something that I'm thinking through a lot right now, because I think we need to kind of war game our way through um, what is happening here, is how would a sanction situation look like if China were able to bring together an effective counter coalition, for example, um, if China has pressure points on various regions that it can bring together and that it can master and bring to the table because it has influence over the critical infrastructure of these countries, over the critical supply um, of digital technologies into these countries. Um, I think that's something we have to think through now um, and adjust our um, policy response towards it. I'm just not 100% sure that, for example, the place that I'm sitting in right now, Berlin, um, has a government that is barely 100 days in office that has hit the ground, not running, but running, sprinting and stumbling at the same time, I would say, from, from this like early COVID crisis to a Ukraine crisis, that there is bandwidth to have these kind of really long-term strategic thoughts right now. Um, and there is political bandwidth to invest um, in these cases. So I'm... Um, not very optimistic that we will have a really good answer here um, anytime soon. Thank you. It did strike me, uh, perhaps the West, uh, defined broadly, has had a rather complacent attitude, mainly commercial, to these areas. And for example, when we had the 5G debate, it was very striking that the uh, some European uh, telecom companies, including the French, were against any move uh, uh, about Huawei because this was the company they had to deal with in third countries anyway uh, and they could not afford uh, to cut ties. So maybe we need uh, some kind of more integrated approach and, and package uh, to some of these countries rather than just lecture them uh, on, you know, you shouldn't team up with the bad guys unless you're a bad guy yourself. Uh, do Emily and, Sam and, and Samantha, Emily has signed on, please. I just want to second what you said. I mean, recognizing, of course, um, the limits of reality. There's no way to compete with Beijing 
if there's no if we're not in other countries if we're not presenting an alternative um and it might be really difficult but i think that's where an answer in those regions start it's that the us and eu have to be investing in alternative systems to china's um and if there's limited and shrinking bandwidth which it seems that there is to some extent, maybe that can be addressed through greater integration of the Global Gateways and the Build Back Better World projects. Um, at least if they're moving in the same direction and with similar priorities, then they can be building on each other um, and taking the most advantage of whatever bandwidth there is. I also think that shrinking bandwidth raises the imperative of finding a way to work with the private sector on this. Um, Francois, exactly as you said, but how can there be not the Chinese version of, but US and EU versions of public private partnerships that incentivize the private sector to invest in third party countries um, in ways that are probably beneficial in their long term interests, but they don't currently have the incentive to do in the short term, and not in a way that's just partnering with Huawei, but in a way that addresses um, the whole value chain of the infrastructure project. I realize, though, that this is a pie in the sky vision, considering the tremendous constraints. Um, raised by Yanka. Samantha, do you want to, to add your, or not, not particularly? Um, so I think the only thing that, that I'd like to add, and perhaps it starts to shift the topic a little bit, but um, one thing that I've been thinking about more recently is um, the, the way that in, in China, you've got, um, so I was looking at patents a little bit last year and 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 the development of critical technologies. And one thing that's so clear in China is that there's a somewhat longer term uh, clear strategy when it comes to the development of of critical technologies and the um, uh, innovation happens to meet those strategic needs. And that not that's not necessarily ideal uh, way of innovation uh, elsewhere, but what happens in, in Europe and the United States elsewhere is that innovation tends to be, you see um, maybe fewer patents in, in, in countries that are having a major impact on a field, but that's not necessarily tied to a strategic objective of, uh, of a country, and partly because there's not a common, a common language or understanding of what those objectives would be. So part of the problem solving and part of, part of the, um, you know, figuring out how it is that we do develop an alternative requires having a clear conversation about what the strategic objectives are and being clear about, um, you know, between researchers um, and, and companies and uh, decision makers, uh, what that terminology, you know, using a common language around what those objectives are. Uh, otherwise, um, you know, we'll continue to have great innovation, uh, but that won't necessarily need the, meet the strategic needs that we're discussing in this panel. Thank you. I move to the next question, uh, which to me is, 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 is not necessarily easy to understand. What trends and practices have you observed in terms of coordination between the CCP's United Front propaganda strategies and China's global digital strategy. And I don't think it's a question about hardware or the system. I think it's a question about the users that the digital network is, is, is put to. My own very quick, quick uh, intuitive answer, I used to make a simplistic distinction between Russia and China in that aspect until the pandemic struck, until COVID, which was China used all of this to propagandize about itself, to show how good it was. And in fact, it's a, a permanent rule of uh, for the social media, not to answer criticism from outside, just to address the strong points where Russia, of course, slandered, planted false information for a very long time. I personally think the distinction has blurred uh, since COVID uh, and it's being shown even as we speak about Ukraine uh, in China's reaction. But I'd, I'd very much like to have your, your, your takes, uh, especially if they differ. Who wants to, to come in? You raise your just hand just two seconds on, on that, okay. if, I, if I'm allowed, because Samantha is the real expert here and, and should be speaking on this. But uh, I do think that's something we have to watch right now is kind of the correlation in the propaganda world uh, between China and Russia around the crisis. I think that's something that is not something we've seen before in that context. Um, and so far as there are kind of more mutually reinforcing narratives being put forward on things as um, 
horrifying as the use of chemical weapons. And so I think we just need to really keep a really, really close eye on what is going on there and how these technology spaces are going to become um, more similar um, in the digital world, more similar, but also in the propaganda world, more similar and maybe more aligned in the future, or whether there is a cutting off point at a certain point when the Chinese um, leadership says, hang on, this is going like ways too far and is dragging us down a road that we actually don't want to be down on. I'm still waiting for that point. I haven't seen it yet, um, but but maybe it's coming. Um, but Samantha, I think you're you're the real expert on this stuff. Samantha? Thank you. And we have uh, to be quick I'll... now. I have one or two more questions to take. Okay, and, uh, I'll be, I'll be super, super quick with the, uh, on the United Front, I think that actually the best person to, to refer to is probably my, my former colleague, Alex Josky. But on, on data and propaganda in particular, um, I, I would say that, you know, with a lot of the conversation on Chinese propaganda focuses on the outputs. So the Twitter operations that, that are identified and, and the Twitter takedowns and all, and that, that research is incredibly important. Um, but the other aspect that we aren't talking about enough is, is sort of that GTCom type example that I gave where you've got a lot of companies, uh, both tech companies as well as others that are investing in um, the kinds of things that an advertising country, a company would be interested in as well uh, to, collect data about societies to understand how to better influence them. And we're kind of overlooking that as part of the overall strategy. That's more that's broader than United Front work. Um, but that's uh, that's an important part of the conversation, I think, that, that we need to start having around what China is actually doing. Because if you look at the outputs, there's a tendency to say, well, China is somewhat clumsy. But we forget that, A, there's an element of distraction there uh, where, you know, I don't think we should be paying attention to just the wolf warriors on, on Twitter. Uh, we should also be paying attention to the, the uh, less visible activity, um, including that, like the, the propaganda department link company that, that I described earlier. Um, there's many other companies that are doing similar things. That's just one case study out of probably hundreds. Thank you. I can only take one last question and I apologize to the other people who put in questions. And that one is about a report from the other ISS, the ISS of Peking University, the one that's uh, is or was headed, by the way, by uh, Professor Wang Ti Si. Uh, apparently, they put out a report on the internet that said that China's, uh, uh, China's tech uh, was actually much more behind the US than uh, conveniently uh, submitted by Chinese uh, and even American reports, and apparently the report was quickly deleted. Uh, that's kind of a question about, uh, you know, from the old days of the 60s, the missile gap issue uh, with the Soviet Union. Are we exaggerating uh, what uh, uh, China has achieved in the digital area? And I would add again that at several points through this report, there are parts where the authors acknowledge that the result is not yet uh, what is it, what what the Chinese aim at. Uh, uh, but your take on that is absolutely welcome, and it will be the last uh, interventions. I will switch when you finish uh, the roundtable directly to Tara Varma. Whoever. Maybe I'll kick it off very briefly on this one. Um, also, I think your answer there it hits the nail on the head. Um, what is it that China is aiming for? And the other thing I you know, want to start off this answer by saying is that this report is very intentionally on China's digital ambitions, not China's technological ambitions. Um, technology, needless to say, is necessary for pursuing China, China's digital strategy, but those are different things. Um, and this is a case where China, it, China's ability to access global data and also to influence global data has tremendous implications really whether or not China is ahead on the technology, on the you know, specific upstream technology front in particular. Um, if Beijing has more data, it can better apply machine learning capabilities um, because they're trained on a greater base of resource. Um, if China can shape international data flows, it can shape international perceptions and movements, and you don't need the most cutting edge technologies to do any of those things. Um, and the corollary here is that we're not in the Cold War environment anymore. We're in a very globalized environment where 
Beijing can access the technology developed elsewhere. So maybe what's coming out of the domestic Chinese innovation ecosystem lags behind that of the US or EU one, but there is a bridge connecting those. And I believe that it was also this report that mentioned that um, because of China's re relative research capabilities, a tech decoupling would have very negative implications for China. Um, so therefore, it took into account the fact that even if China's domestic system isn't yet at this level, it benefits from the international system and is able to pursue its ambitions effectively regardless of not being at the most cutting edge. Samantha, quickly. Or Yanka, uh, for that matter. Two, two, uh, sorry, Yanka, do you want to? Uh, two quick responses. One is that when we think about technology, we always have to think about it evolving on a trajectory. We aren't actually talking about today's capabilities. We're thinking about tomorrow's and, and all assessment needs to sort of take that into account. So even when there are weaknesses in, in what we're seeing in, uh, evolve in China, we can assume based on both history and, and the sort of development of the trajectory that, that that'll change. Uh, but then the next thing I want to say is that the competition to me is also in the space of um, ideas and the idea about how uh, one can derive value out of out of data and out of technology. And I think that if, particularly for China, just in terms of the thinking about uh, how data derived from one source when aggregated can contribute to multiple different aspects of problem solving um it, it shows you that i think there's more sort of strategic thinking in, in that domain and, and perhaps china is more advanced there than we are elsewhere at present and that might be changing thank you yanka maybe i'll just add maybe a thought also very inspired from the last two weeks that is saying maybe we should plan more for the worst case and less for the best case scenarios that are at play. And in this case, I would say we should probably you know, be careful um, not to underestimate um, because overestimating in this case would just make us compete better um, in that in that regard, um, whereas uh, underestimating may leave us in a very dire spot. So um, it's just a little, um, yeah, maybe slightly inspired by, by what has happened. Thank you very much, Yanka. My own words would be, it's always very hard to judge tech supremacy and who is ahead in particular technology. It's a question that needs to be broken down. But one thing we can say for sure from this report is that whatever China has, it uses and applies more freely and effectively under the eye of the government, of course, than companies in democratic systems which are bound by a number of rules, regulations, uh, avoidance, and watchdogs. Uh, that's very, there's only one watchdog essentially in China. Uh, I will uh, end there this very interesting session, thanking the three of you, uh, and I will turn over to uh, Tara for the second uh, round table. Tara, on to you. Thank you so much, Francois, uh, and, and to the panelists. Your, your last line was actually going to be my first line, which is that um, in the report, of course, there are several mentions of how the asymmetry plays between China and the West, or basically the Chinese order but, and, and the liberal order. Uh, and, and I think Emily mentions that, you know, there is scale, centralization and the industrial dimension too. But I was struck in the conversation that there's one element of asymmetry, which is um, that in the state capitalist system, you have, you know, the decision making process is constituted of one. And in the multilateral system, there's, there are quite a lot of stakeholders. I hope that in the long run, uh, the fact that we're together will help us go further. But in, in the short term, for sure, you know, there is a competitive advantage for China. And I think we've been trying to lay out um, several of the elements that have been presented in, in the report. I'm very happy to have a stellar panel here too. Greg Levesque, co-founder and chief executive officer at Strider, Mathieu Duchatel, director of the Asia program at the Institut Montaigne, and Matt Turpin, visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution and former U.S. National Security Council director for China. Both Greg and Matt have uh, very interesting pieces in the report, and, and they complement uh, one another very well, I would say. And, and we'll start with, with Greg, because I think you have a case study uh, of how commercial entities also and, and the way China uses commercial entities uh, might weaken the international system and might really threaten uh, US and, and other Western companies. And so if you could maybe um, 
get, dive a bit more into into your chapter in the report, explain where we are at, um, then we'll turn to to Matthew and to Matt. Um, Craig, the, the floor is yours. Well, uh, I first want to thank uh, the, the National Bureau of Asian Research for uh, supporting this project, and then obviously the European Council on Foreign Relations for um, hosting us today. Um, and uh, and Tara, thanks to you for uh, for the question. So, you know, my my chapter really looked at the security implications of China's digital ambitions, and um, what we try to do is bring it to life in, in the real world. Um, a lot of talk uh, today and in the past when you looked at China and, the, and their strategies whether it be foreign policy or economic development strategies, you oftentimes see um, the analysis stay at kind of that policy level. Um, we spend a lot of time looking at the tactical level. So how do those policies and strategies then get translated into the real world and then lead to action that can be disruptive, beneficial, right? And then how should we you know, respond to that? Um, one of the unique characteristics that uh, I've been focused on for quite some time and, and talk quite a bit about in the chapter is the use of commercial entities um, in in this era of strategic competition, um, and you could you could argue that that's a new uh, vector that is being used in a way that um, has not been traditionally done. Um, you know, in the United States in the 40s and 50s, if you look at national security strategy, there was an economic statecraft element in it. A lot of that was built around rebuilding uh, relationships post World War II. In fact. Um, and then using uh, you know, corporate entities to help drive development globally. In the case of China, uh, what we're seeing is uh, the use of commercial entities really to almost obfuscate, but then also drive government initiatives. So a couple of the examples that uh, are in my chapter have to do with the use of commercial actors to then uh, set up digital platforms, oftentimes in line with the Belt and Road Initiative and strategy and actually tactically implement those strategies to uh, collect data on uh, ASEAN states, uh, countries in the Middle East and Central Asia, and then use that data to uh, better improve Beijing policies and coordination across, across the suite of you know, foreign policy, economic development, uh, and, and in some cases, even military engagement. So all of that, I think, is a, is a new factor that's, that's coming into play here. And, and I, would, I would also kind of go back in time a little bit just to frame the conversation. We talk, um, when you think about geostrategy of Mackinder, right? H.J. Mackinder, the godfather of geostrategy, so to speak. Um, and in one of his books right after World War I called uh, Democratic Ideals and Reality, he talks a little bit about the different uh, perspectives that uh, you know, different countries have. It's very terrestrial in that it talks about the seaman's view, talks about you know, the land-based view. In today's world, there's another domain that often gets overlooked and it's, it's digital, right? That is a new area, area of competition. Um, it, it is, it, the space is largely occupied by industry and that is where we're seeing this, this uh, friction in the analysis between the West and China because unlike in the West where that is an industry-led domain, in China, there's a large governmental impact and driver in it. Um, so with that, I'll, I'll pause and, 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 uh, and turn it back. But thank you for that question and look forward to digging in here further. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I already have a few questions for you and I'm sure they'll come in, in the chat too. Mathieu, let me turn to you because uh, I think you also have the role of commentator here and you've been following those issues for, for a long time. I'm still following them. So it would be great to have your point of view and maybe a European outlook as well on this. Thanks, thanks, Tara. Um, and uh, congratulations from me as well to the authors of a very interesting report. I think the report makes a very clear and persuasive argument regarding China's strategic intentions and thinking regarding the ongoing digital transformation based on Chinese sources um, and also presents um, many interesting recommendations on how to adjust to this changing reality that can be described as an expansion of China's digital footprint in infrastructure, hardware, platforms, uh, but also outreach on Western platforms and like many of you, I'm exposed to this uh, watching the Ukraine war uh, on Twitter. 
And um, I, I make three points in reaction to, to the reports. I'll try to be, um, to brief, to be brief. Um, first, I broadly agree with the main arguments. Uh, I think that from a strategic perspective, China sees dominance over access to data as something necessary to reshape the international order. That's the very strategic level. Um, and this is indeed a question of control over information. And there is a parallel uh, between information dominance domestically, which is a tool of social control to engage in surveillance, to enforce uh, the social order, and information dominance internationally, uh, which is something more from a balance of power perspective. Uh, but I think that two things matter here. The first is that uh, this sounds like, at least at first glance, this is an expansion of a military logic to international competition. Uh, and the logic is that the state that has the best situational awareness, the best intelligence, is in a situation of superiority and makes better decision if it has the capacity to process the information. And also it does have better leverage on other states, on companies and on individuals. But it's not only about that, um, because there is a values deep dimension. And Matt Turpin will speak next in his chapter. He argues that um, Chinese digital platform risk becoming an operating system for an illiberal international order. And of course, if there is a built-in censorship in the apps you use daily, or if your personal information can be used against you for hostile purposes, uh, that clearly undermines democratic governance and that undermines the protection of individual rights. Um, but I make one point here. I think it's about power, it's about values, but one can also argue, and that connects to the end of the previous panel, that China is not yet in the position of international domination, even though these things change uh, and, uh, and there is no status quo. And I quote here my colleague, um, Viviana Zhu, who last year uh, produced a report regarding Chinese fintech platforms, uh, which clearly shows that um, the presence of Chinese fintech platforms in Europe is extremely limited, uh, especially in comparison to tech giants from the US. Um, and, and also it shows very clearly that the legal barriers in the European single market make it very difficult for Chinese platforms to expand. So here, what I think is interesting from a European perspective is that the challenge clearly is to regulate and, and to a large degree to counter this expanding footprint for the reasons outlined earlier. Um, but it's difficult intellectually to get there because for many Europeans, we have what can be described as a kind of dual use problem uh, by analogy with export control which I would describe the following way, what is commercially attractive and convenient for users, and what primarily is a question of profit and business interest for Chinese companies is also an instrument of influence with the potential of being weaponized uh, if needed. And of course, many continue to look at this from the perspective of business interests rather than strategic competition including many in China and many in those companies. And the argument that information dominance is not necessarily going to be weaponized um, is uh, in fact quite widespread. Uh, that's the optimism that uh, Yanka uh, ended her presentation on. So how should we respond in Europe? Um, I think we should definitely think in terms of vulnerabilities to reduce and also strengths to develop seems to me that um, we are going in that direction, uh, that Europe has awakened to the notion of geopolitical risks, the notion of balance of power, the idea of technological power as an element of security, um, as an element of um, building the resilience that is needed to withstand disruptions of supply chains, um, and that this is connected to the defense of the democratic order in Europe um, and the tools that are being built uh, and there are tools being built need to be sharpened. And, and I think that's the interesting point um, politically that uh, we are building those tools, 
but they need to be sharpened. Um, there is an issue of bureaucratic efficiency. There is an issue, there is an issue of capacity building in EU member states. Um, and there is an issue also of building the channels and the um, mechanisms to work efficiently, uh, not only with the US, but also uh, in particular when it comes to China, with states in East Asia uh, with whom uh, we share this uh, problem. And I think the first of them is definitely Japan. Um, Tara, do, do I have time to go into some of these details or should I just stop here and uh, continue afterwards during the discussion? Maybe quickly in, in a couple of minutes, is that okay? And then we can go to Matt and then go back to the discussion. Can I leave you, if I leave you two minutes, is that fine? Or would you rather we go come back to this in the discussion? Okay, let's come back to that um, in the discussion because I think it's interesting to look at some of these tools in details, but I don't want to be... So no, no, no. So let's, let's okay. Let's take let's take a bit of time to discuss them now, and then we'll we'll turn to Matt right after that. So you have the floor for a little longer, Matthew. Yeah. So, no, I just want to um, you know, draw also from my next uh, report that is going to be published uh, next week, which is precisely on that the defensive tools and the offensive tools that Europe has to position itself better uh, in this context uh, facing China, but also in the context of U.S.-China competition, which is as Structural factor uh, for the for all decisions, um, and uh, and I want to point two things. You know, on the defensive side, the question of regulating technology transfers, uh, which I think is a work in progress, uh, on which we have made quite a lot of progress, but which remains unfinished business. Um, I think you know both on the side of investment screening and on the side of export control, but also in the area of education and research cooperation. Um, the systems that are being put in place in Europe have a lot of room for improvement. Uh, and I'll just give a couple of quick examples. Um, for example, investment screening. I mean, there's a lot of capacity building work to do in member states uh, so that they have the capacity to monitor incoming investment that comes with an access to technology. Uh, another example when it comes to investment screening, there is um, a working group inside the Transatlantic Trade and Technology Council uh, for investment screening, uh, which is great. Uh, I think there is room to replicate this mechanism with other countries or to in fact, trilateralize uh, this mechanism to also include Japan. I think it would be in the interest of uh, European efficiency when it comes to screening incoming investments. So that's another example. Um, I give you also uh, one or two examples on the offensive side, because this is, I think, something really important. Um, and here uh, it is about hardware and it's about the semiconductor sector in particular, which is mentioned uh, here and there in the NBR report. I think that the new European approach uh, to semiconductors provides a blueprint to maintain, um, you know, and to enhance uh, Europe's position, in fact, to enhance Europe's position in this uh, area of uh, hardware and to reduce vulnerabilities to possible disruptions. Um, and, and also to own choke points, um, to create our own options for access disruption you know, in times of crisis. Um, and the EU Chips Act that was adopted earlier this year in February completely changes the European approach when it comes to state aid, state aid for industrial production. Uh, and when I see that in the context of the invasion of Ukraine, uh, some in Europe start advocating for a fund of funds, uh, you know, to really support uh, key strategic industries. In Europe, I think that there is a blueprint to be found in the way we are approaching uh, the semiconductor sector to, in fact, untie our hands when it comes to uh, intervene in support of a particular industry. I mean, these are examples. Uh, the report is extremely comprehensive. I just mentioned hardware and I mentioned 
tech transfers, I think that there are two extremely important elements of any answer. But clearly, um, this is only these are only two elements, and um, data regulations, privacy laws is a huge area, but it's not my area of expertise. Uh, I think you know some others might be willing to jump in to also comment on those other aspects of the defensive agenda. But I stop here. Thanks a lot, Mathieu, and that's actually a perfect segue into Matt's presentation because I, coordinating better or even adapting U.S. law to the example of the European one is one of the recommendations that you put forward, Matt, in, in your report, which actually has a lot of very comprehensive uh, recommendations. I think it would be great if you could um, explain to us this, this framework that you're thinking of, how we can reply to it, because I think uh, the report is incredible in, in the analysis and the diagnostic that it poses, but it's also great to know that we're not just facing this very grim situation with, with no, I was going to say weapons, which is maybe not the best way to put it, but with, with no instruments in our hand, and you seem to show that we have quite a few, both regulatory, but also in, when it comes to software and, and hardware. So I will leave the floor to you now. Thanks. Well, thank you, Tara. And uh, you know, first I wanna, wanna thank the National Bureau of Asian Research uh, for inviting me to, to participate and, and author a chapter on recommendations. Um, and, and certainly, you know, uh, a, a, a deep, Thanks to to our hosts and 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 some very good friends of mine at at both Institute Montaigne and 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 the European Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, you know, real pleasure to be uh, with with colleagues here. Um, you know, uh, so maybe I'll start with maybe you know, a bit of uh, you know rehashing what a couple of folks have covered, and then and then I'll dive into you know uh, a couple of specific recommendations uh, that I made in my my chapter. Um, I I think you know it's. Uh, it, it is not an exaggeration to say that that our digital infrastructure um, serves as the pipes and wires and as the operating system of a normative liberal international order um, and that 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 we should look at it that way and I think Greg's point um, about you know thinking about the digital sort of domain and the digital infrastructure as sort of a new domain of competition, um, and, and thinking about that in a geopolitical sense and the decisions that, that we as, as sort of democracies that live in sort of, you know, we wish to, to run things in sort of a normative sense, um, we've chosen uh, to, to allow uh, sort of uh, commercial, uh, private and, and government interests to all exist as stakeholders sort of equally inside that system. Um, and that has created a unique infrastructure that already exists. I think it's 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 quite clear that that infrastructure and the way it exists poses an existential threat to the way in which the Chinese Communist Party you know sees its ability to to impose social control within its own borders and given the sort of the pathologies of the party sort of ruling techniques it means that it views sort of threats anywhere in that digital, digital infrastructure you know overseas as potential threats to its control, right? And therefore, you know, as as the party seeks to sort of control across digital infrastructure, its its own citizens, the fact that that interconnects uh, with our countries, increasingly, the party views the way in which we operate as threats to them. And I think, you know, certainly the evidence of of you know, the way in which the party uh, and and Vladimir Putin views color revolutions. The way in which they look at those kinds of activities and the way in which those uh, those ideas spread as vectors across digital infrastructure um, you know, is the underlying sort of motivation for why the party would pursue a digital strategy to remake digital infrastructure in to, to take up the characteristics that serve to protect the party's interests, right? And so, therefore, and obviously, we are as 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 I think everybody has pointed out here, the party is not complete in that, right? They have not achieved that yet. I think, though, that what we've laid out, I think, fairly persuasively, and and certainly we aren't alone in this, is that it's very clear what they intend to do. And so, the question for us is, uh, you know, when is it when is it optimal for us to intervene? Uh, to to maintain our interests and to maintain a system uh, that reflects 
the normative values that 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 we want it to to hold, right? Is it does it make more sense to intervene now to begin to prevent them from achieving those objectives, or do we wait until it is all manifest, and that that is the point in time in which we intervene? And and you know my my position, you know obviously the way I sort of framed it, I think is pretty clear. I think it's it's far better for us to intervene now. Uh, the costs are lower. The, the costs are not zero uh, to intervene now. They are costly, but they will only grow over time, uh, and they will only become much more difficult to solve uh, over time. And therefore, you know, intervening now to reshape our our sort of digital infrastructure to reflect our values um, is is the way to is, is the way we should be approaching this. And so, you know, I tried to lay out. <clears throat> Uh, really, sort of eight recommendations uh, that would would get us down that that road, um, and maybe I'll just real quick sort of run through them, and then and then we can open it up for questions. Yeah, you know, first of them, you know, as as, as Francois you know mentioned in the front, um, I think it's 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 critical for the United States uh, to adopt and align uh, privacy laws uh, that 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 sort of create a, a common understanding. Um, obviously, when we when we collectively created the digital infrastructure uh, that we had today, it was insufficient to protect those kinds of interests. Um, and we should recognize that and create the sort of normative rules that apply across that uh, to be able to make that happen. I think it's it's critically important for us, you know, as a second uh, recommendation for us to, to develop really a, a common operating picture across technological, industrial, commercial, systems that the, the sort of the pipes and wires and the operating system that runs the digital infrastructure we as democracies have to have a, a a tactile understanding of what that landscape looks like and how it interconnects because it's i think it's nearly impossible for us to figure out how to effectively intervene and to shift that system in, in a direction that we want without an understanding of how that system is set up in 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 significant detail, what are the commercial relationships between companies? Uh, you know how how does technology flow? Uh, what do supply chains look like? Without that, it's really difficult to figure out how we would use the offensive and defensive tools that 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 uh, Matthias uh, laid out to begin to apply those effectively. Right, you have to understand the situation in order to figure out how to apply the tools. Um, I think you know it, it is unquestionable that, that 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 democracies need to commit to higher levels of of R and D spending uh, across their countries um, in order to sort of run faster and and be able to provide sort of the innovative engine to be able to make that happen. I think fundamentally we are going to need to uh, to reverse the trends of the last two decades, in which uh, through through a a, a concept of globalization, what we really did was to, to pursue hyper concentration of manufacturing in one country, particularly around the electronics industry. And with that, that has created significant vulnerabilities for us by, by placing sort of the lion's share of global manufacturing for electronics in China. And until we begin to reverse that trend and diversify our manufacturing base um, and diversify the the benefits of globalization to other countries and other regions, uh, we will find ourselves in a difficult situation. Uh, number five, um, you know, I think fundamentally we are going to have to establish new standards bodies, um, and and we will have to actively keep the PRC a non-normative power, a power that is is fundamentally not seeking uh, to establish the same kind of of norm setting uh, uh, rules uh, that. That, that we are seeking to, to achieve to exclude them from those those processes. And that sounds, I understand, extreme. Um, and I, I was you know, debated and you know, sort of go back to Yanka's uh, comments in the last panel. Um, I debated whether or not that would be seen as too, too extreme. Although, you know, given the developments over the last two weeks, I, I think that increasingly that, that needs to be a, a real consideration that we're making is that there are certain powers, Beijing and Moscow, that are not particularly productive in those standard setting bodies and and they don't they really shouldn't be brought in to what those systems are um you know number six 
Um, you know, fundamentally, we're going to need to reconstruct our existing digital infrastructure into something that better reflects our values um, and that, that that will require significant investment. And I think countries uh, you know, have have started down that road. It is really we're starting from zero, uh, but we will need to accelerate that. You know, number seven um, is that that you know as 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 my colleagues have sort of pointed out, we are going to have to coordinate across democracies the the uh, the application of those policy tools uh, to achieve our outcomes, and and that will mean. Um, you know, having sort of detailed and more uh, 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 expansive sort of, of of sessions and bodies to be able to make sure that those those things are coordinated. I think we're on 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 track for that, uh, but it will require uh, it will require increased uh, attention. And then lastly, uh, you know, the, the eighth one um, is that that fundamentally we're going to need to expand sort of the digital trade provisions uh, to include more democracies and to sort of equalize that across uh, those countries that choose to be part of an, a normative system. Um, I, you know, we've, we've started down that road already, uh, but it's probably the pathway that we're going to have to continue to follow uh, to create the markets to support the commercial enterprises uh, that will be, that will provide the pipes and wires and the operating systems of what we want to have. And so I don't think we should be scrapping, you know, our approach which is to allow sort of multiple stakeholders to take part in this, but we should be discriminatory about sort of uh, uh, those stakeholders who are not, uh, who do not hold the same sort of values and interests uh, to be able to shape what that system looks like. Um, and that, that that's kind of the pathway we have forward. Um, so that's, that's, that's a quick rundown of, of sort of what we covered in that chapter. Um, and, and Tara, I turn it back over to you for, for, for questions. Thanks a lot. That was fascinating. And I think that I would say the your last three, three recommendations are really also in line with the debates that's happening in Europe right now. For us, the, the values dimension is maybe a bit more complicated. We refer to it in the 2019 Commission communication by systemic rivalry, but I think this it portrays quite well basically all the challenges that cut across our relationship with China because we have such an interdependency. Uh, both with the, the system and, and its economy that we have to find find a way forward. But um, we have to make sure that our openness, which is our strength, is not too much of a vulnerability and it's turning more and more into our, a vulnerability. I, but I think we also have to be careful not to close ourselves off. And I think this is where the, the difficulty lies ahead. Uh, we have 12 minutes left. And actually, I have uh, one question for each of you coming from the chat. Uh, Greg, there's one which is there seems to be a disconnect between the urgency of the threats uh, of the threat digital China, sorry, digital ambition pose and the pace at which countries are responding. How best can the US and Europe work together to close this gap? Mathieu, um, you bring to these issues both a deep understanding of the European perspective on China, as well as an understanding of China's activities uh, within the Indo-Pacific. When it comes to crafting a unified response among like-minded countries, what do you think are key considerations for European and Asian partners? And finally, for Matt, there are, well, two of them, but actually I would say one, one big question. When you were in government seeking to bring together a coalition of like-minded countries to respond to China's digital ambitions and the security risks they pose, what was the biggest challenge you faced? Was there a sector or tool uh, Beijing targets that you thought was particularly challenging to respond to? On the flip side to that, what was one area uh, that you thought was an informative success? What lessons need to be taken from that success and applied to other policy responses? Um, maybe Greg, we turn back to you first, uh, and don't 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 hesitate to take a bit more time as well. I think thanks for the question. So, um, look, I, the first thing that comes to mind is is uh, one of leadership, you know. And so, so, when you talk about how do you how do you um, bridge that gap between what the U.S. is doing and 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 Europe and other like minded nation states, I think first and foremost it comes back to aligning on um, a shared vision. And a shared um, uh, perspective around the problem set and the challenge that is confronting all of us, um, and actually articulating that to our respective citizens. Um, and I know this is something that Matt and I have talked a little bit about in the past. 
you know, a lot of these conversations are happening in Brussels, in London, in DC. Um, there needs to be a broader coalition and engagement across um, our respective populations to say, this is now an uh, existential issue for our country. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, everybody from China, everybody from Russia is now somehow a threat and that we need to kind of take that kind of lens to uh, implementing policy. But I think what we're seeing across the board is that um, citizens want to engage in, in addressing these problems. And um, when we do that, we actually start to see markets move, companies changing their corporate positions. And actually, you know, even in the case of what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, in Ukraine um, a real willingness and appetite to actually incur losses to their business operations in order to stay in line with um, the ideals of, of that host nation. So first and foremost, I'd say one is leadership. The next piece uh, comes back to actually identifying uh, the strategic points that we want to go address. Um, I think one of the one of the um, challenges in uh, tackling China as a strategic competitor or adversary, however you want to look at it, is where to start. Um, you you know you can get quickly overwhelmed with the scale of their activities, with the scale of their ambitions, um, but when you look at uh, where they're targeting their resources and where the um, mountaintops, so to speak, of the fourth industrial revolution are going to emerge. Um, those are great places to begin implementing policies and engaging industry to go move towards um, uh, winning those races. So semiconductors comes to mind, right? Strategic industry, um, clearly dual use, critical for um, not only economic growth and development, but obviously um, waging and winning, winning military conflict, particularly in a protracted battle, right? So that's uh, obviously one. AI is another that's talked quite a bit about in, in the reporting. Quantum is another one. So I think once you start to, to drill in on where are the uh, strategic domains that are going to define the winners and losers of this next era, that should be the focal points for initial alignment between the US, Europe, and, and allies um, around how do we begin to ensure that we're winning and staying uh, the pace setters in these competitions, but then also being able to meaningfully respond to China and other adversaries who are uh, like-mindedly engaged in that in that competition. Thanks a lot. I won't get into more details here, but I have to say the world aligning uh, tends to irk a few people in in Europe. I think there is a sense that there could be more convergence, but but. Um, maybe that's um, we should keep that for another conversation on on EU US uh, relations on on China. Um, Mathieu, do you want to take uh, your question now? Yes, sure, with uh, <clears throat> with pleasure, and um, and uh, let me tackle the challenge of connecting the discussion we're having right now with the other discussions uh, that take place uh, here and there regarding the Indo-Pacific. It's not um, it's not exactly easy, but it's uh, interesting and important. Um, and, and I should say first that I don't think that, you know, the two issues uh, in the Pacific and China's digital strategy can be completely addressed within a multilateral framework of, you know, states within the Indo-Pacific region that will work efficiently together uh, within such a framework. Um, but, but I think that there is a lot of potential convergence between states uh, in the Indo-Pacific and um, the EU and European member states around the three things in particular. First, I think, and it's a result of COVID, um, but it's also a result of threat perceptions in the aftermath of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I think there is a heightened threat perception regarding uh, problems arising from disruptions of supply chains, uh, which is really a lingering issue, and uh, policies that are being adopted uh, by uh, you know, sovereign countries, also by the EU, to reduce the vulnerability of supply chains, and that very simply are you know, industrial policies to uh, re-industrialize, relocate uh, industries, but also to diversify and to uh, work together to identify bottlenecks, do crisis scenarios. Uh, sometimes it's quite 
nature. I think the Transatlantic Trade and um, Technology Council provides a very good example of focusing uh, narrowly on how to identify bottlenecks uh, and try to preempt them. Uh, and I think that's really a line of uh, action that can be used with other countries as well that face similar issues and that also see an opportunity for their own um, industrialization. So I think that's um, a positive element. Um, and the other one I would like to mention among like-minded countries um, is the fact that the digital transformation we are talking about in many, many areas is inherently dual use, uh, which is extremely tricky. Uh, but many of the technologies we are discussing have mainly commercial applications, but also applications for military modernization, um, which, uh, of course, for regulatory authorities, export control authorities, is a huge challenge. And the discussion that is taking place in the US regarding identifying and, in fact, listing emerging and foundation, foundational technologies is a discussion we're having in Europe as well. And that is also taking place in Japan and in other countries as well. Um, I think that there is a potential for more concerted action to take, you know, uh, seize and identify those technologies and create um, regimes of export control that um, focus on their dual use nature. Um, let's just talk about their military applications. And I think that for semiconductors, for example, extreme ultraviolet technology is an extremely good example because today and tomorrow it's 99.99% commercial application, but in 2050, the application that it could have in terms of enhancing command and control, uh, you know, for our military power is uh, also quite obvious. So I would emphasize these two aspects uh, and get back to you. Thanks a lot, Matt. You have three minutes before the end of the panel. So I know there was a lot in the questions that were posed to you, but you can choose <laughs> what you answer to basically. Yeah. So, so thanks. And so I, it, you know, when I served in, in, in the US government, um, I principally saw my role uh, as, as to explain how the US government was conducting a reassessment of its relationship with the PRC um, and, and how we were changing, you know, our strategic approach, uh, a strategic approach that, that for three decades had been based upon using economic development to drive political liberalization, sort of the, the peace through trade, you know, theory, um, you know, from that strategic approach to, to a strategic approach of strategic competition. And I saw my job is is primarily to treat you know my 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 partners in Europe and Japan and Korea and uh, you know and multiple other countries um, as 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 partners and that that really my role was to simply explain what our thinking was and why we were making our decisions and to remain engaged on that and so yeah the challenge in that is you know it takes time to build those relationships and to sort of answer all of the questions and sort of go through, but and, but but a commitment to that over time uh, leads to what I think is is a principal success is that you clearly today you know, sort of five years on um, we have processes and procedures that are far more routinized between our countries to talk about these issues and to engage on these issues and to talk more openly about our own thinking with the full understanding that on none of these issues are we going to have full agreement. And, and it isn't as if one country is going to lay out, here is the path and everyone has to fall in line, right? But that fundamentally as partners, we are going to come up with what are the common approaches that we can adopt um, and, and work together to achieve those things. And so I, I think that I played, you know, I, I, I'm happy in the, in the small part I played in, in sort of moving that along 
but fundamentally the 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 credit goes to the to the officials in those governments and in and in instant you know in places like the institute montaigne and, and ecfr who have played the critical role in 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 their own reassessments and the changing of their own discussions right those are internal processes that that were not caused by us um, they were they were their own decisions and i think that's that that should give us all a great amount of optimism about the sort of regenerative and 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 real strength of normative liberal democracies that when they seek to concentrate on on a challenge uh, they can bring a lot to bear and that that i think we we should all congratulate ourselves on that you know that that isn't that isn't my work Thanks a lot. Alison, I'll turn to you, just as Russia seems to be uh, playing a lot by, by the Chinese playbook, and it's just announced that it's blocking Instagram and Facebook. So I think we are indeed looking more and more at an authoritarian way of doing things, an authoritarian playbook or a dictatorial playbook to which we have to respond, I think, very firmly and, and resiliently. I don't know if we can say that, at least with resilience. Um, and I think we have great recommendations in the report for that. So I'm, I'm hoping that you'll be able to have these discussions elsewhere in Europe too, because I think it is absolutely fundamental for us to not only keep talking, but keep working together. I will close now and, and thank a lot my panelists for, for this great discussion. I listen on to you. Thanks, Tara. It is indeed and perhaps unfortunately timely um, developments as we talk about these issues and see things play out uh, across real time. Um, to just bring this all to conclusion, I want to thank once again all of our panelists uh, for their presentations, our moderators for um, bringing some fantastic themes and questions together. Uh, and of course, uh, thanks to ECFR and Institute Montaigne for, for this partnering on this great event. Um, it was really exciting to bring it all together and to um, discuss these issues uh, with our European colleagues. So thanks once again for all of that. And thanks to all of our audience for, for joining. Um, we hope you took away something from this discussion and continue to uh, have conversations around these issues. And with that, we'll say goodbye. Thank you.